السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, send blessings and salutations upon the masterpiece Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi. May Allah's peace be upon him and all his companions. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon all his family members. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings be upon every single one of us and our offspring, the ummah at large. Those who are suffering at this moment across the globe, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. And may his assistance come to them wherever they are. I mean, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, before I commence this evening's talk, I need to give you a little bit of a background as to how it materialized. MashaAllah, I had intended to visit KL very privately <laughs> in the sense that I had something to do here. And uh, Together with that, to be very frank and open with you, I needed to visit a doctor. So, I just realized that what I have been preaching all along is true in that, in that rest only comes in your grave, mashallah. <laughs> Come what may, I went to Nankawi the last time and they almost spoke me into giving a talk there and doing a Jum'ah there. And Alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be achieving our rest in our graves. So this is why they say rest in peace, because then you definitely rest in peace. I remember if any one of you have heard me say in Zimbabwe, when the AIDS was at its peak, we used to lose 3,000 lives on average a week in a small country. And there was no place to bury them, according to some people. Not because there was no land, but because the graveyards were becoming full. So instead of designating different areas to be graveyards, they were actually contemplating burying people standing. I'm not joking. I attended the conference, and I was the one who joked about it and said, well, you won't be able to say rest in peace, you have to say stand in peace. <laughs> This evening, inshallah, so I was asked very impromptu to speak, and we, I agreed. We wouldn't disagree unnecessarily, but I did not advertise this intentionally, because I didn't expect it to be something that would have been uh, pre-planned and so on. I felt, you know, those who really follow keenly would get to know somehow that something is going on, you know. And uh, it's something that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us protection. I'm sure a copy of it would be available somewhere, somehow, sometime. So it's not like we're blocking people. But it's just that I am not well at all. I haven't felt like this in the last four or five years. And uh, the last time I felt like this was in Sri Lanka. If you go back and take a look, the exact clothing I'm wearing today, I was wearing it five years ago or four years ago in Sri Lanka. If you look at it, you will see me as sick as ever, speaking just like I am today. But because of the, the, the sincerity of the people in front of us, we don't normally stop smiling, mashallah. So, as I felt earlier today, in fact, when I got up this morning, I thought I'd probably cancel this. And it was not impossible to cancel it because it wasn't advertised as such on my part. But at the same time, I felt, no, if there is any form of, you know, room to cater for it, Bismillah. And mashallah, the Palma has been very kind to us. Uh, and so have all my friends and family members here in Malaysia. Uh, so let's get straight into the topic. The topic this evening that I've been asked to speak about is very relevant, connected to the month of Ramadan and Taqwa. Because we all know that the month of Ramadan is coming you won't have to fast, don't worry, inshallah. <laughs> you, we all know that the month of Ramadan is coming and it's important for us to prepare. The sisters who are seated here this evening and I'm sure all the others across the globe, preparation has started. But in what way, inshallah? In my home, I know they've already started preparing with savouries and with little eats and the special, you know, iftar sort of uh, little 
bites that everyone has, so much so that in the month of food, is it the month of food? I call it the month of food. In the month of no food, there is so much food, so it becomes the month of food. There is more food in our fridges during Ramadan than there is outside Ramadan. And I, this is the case with most, I'm being honest. So we're not supposed to eat, but look at the fridge, full. And did you know the barakah in food in the month when we are not supposed to be eating food during the daylight is such that because we have abstained from eat and drink and so on during the daylight, the little savory you put into your mouth at iftar tastes so much better than the same savory put into your mouth outside Ramadan. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You pick it up, say it's a little pie, not a sweetie pie, but a meat pie or something of that nature. And you put it into your mouth at iftar. The same pie after Ramadan will not taste as grand. That's a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a believer knows the taste. The only thing is, let's understand. We have sometimes, knowingly or unknowingly, become accustomed to an attitude of doing qaba even for food, mashallah. <laughs> so because if a person misses salah during the day like loho, like asr, as soon as you can, you've got to read all of them. You've got to read all this salah. So sometimes some people think that because we didn't eat through the day, they eat double at night. So they have iftar before maghrib, after maghrib there is a beautiful meal, and then they go for Isha and Taraweeh, they come back and have another meal, they get up a few hours later and have another meal, and before you know it, they've already had five or six meals. And this is why some people gain weight in Ramadan. Yes. Allah make it easy for us. But I hope it's not the case. As time is passing, people are becoming more and more health conscious. And people are realizing that Ramadan is a gift for myself and yourselves to look after our health as well. It's an opportunity to learn discipline in food and drink. Learn discipline. If I abstain from food and drink because I needed to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, during the daylight hours of Ramadan, then surely I can abstain from food and drink when it is detrimental for my health. And surely I can abstain from food and drink when that food and drink is not permissible for me. Someone who stopped himself from water during Ramadan will definitely stop himself from alcohol outside Ramadan. Because he knows that if I could control myself from something, that is permissible. Then controlling myself from that which is prohibited is even easier. And this is why we are even taught to control our sexual desires during the month of Ramadan, during daylight hours, prohibited. And here we are talking of your spouse. So a person who has learned to control himself in that regard, outside the month of Ramadan, if ever there is adultery to be committed, they will be the furthest away from it because they have been trained. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, Attaqu Allah. The verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, Kutiba alaykum al-siyamu, Kama kutiba ala alladheena min O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you in the same way it has been prescribed upon those before you in order that you may achieve God consciousness. You may achieve taqwa, piety. You may become conscious of your maker. How do we become conscious of our maker? Well, it's quite easy to understand if we look at it. It's amazing how fasting definitely is connected to consciousness of Allah. You become conscious of food to start with. Because at the beginning of Ramadan, it happened to my mom, my mom once when we were very young. We are actually nine brothers and sisters. And mashallah, off we went to school. And my mom, every day she would prepare, get up early in the morning, have tea and you know, 
we used to have bread with a bit of butter or jam on it, mashallah, and a cup of tea and we would have it and off we were to school, we walked, mashallah. Nowadays, the schools are closer than that and still we drop them off with the motor vehicle. But that time we walked to school, alhamdulillah, and then the mums, mashallah, when everyone is gone, they would sit, you know, perhaps sleep for a little while, rest, and then get up, prepare a little bit for themselves, sit and have their own, for example, a little breakfast, not to say anything large or big, but something to fill their bellies. So, first day of Ramadan, and we were all set off to school, mum went back to sleep, and after a while she got up, prepared her breakfast, and mashallah, she ate a proper meal. And when she finished, she said, oh, it's Ramadan. It's Ramadan. So sometimes it happens to us that the first day or two, we tend to, sometimes, we become less conscious of it. And then we immediately remember. So Rasulullah has dealt with this issue. He says, مَنْ نَسِيَ وَهُوَ صَائِمٌ فَأَكَلَ أَوْ شَرِبَ فَلْيُتِمَّ صَوْمَهُ فَإِنَّمَا أَطْعَمَهُ اللَّهُ وَسَقَاهُ Allahu Akbar. If you hear the meaning of it, it's beautiful. Then I tell you what some of the youngsters say. The meaning, the Prophet says, whoever has forgotten whilst fasting, forgotten whilst fasting, so they have eaten or drunk food or drunk a drink, you know, drunk something. We're not talking of drunk as in alcohol, obviously, but we're talking of having drunk something. They should then complete their fast, don't consider it broken, because Allah is the one who fed them and gave them drink. Amazing, amazing. So the youth tell you, may Allah make me forget during the day. <laughs> may Allah make me forget. That's the new generation of people. They look at it the other way around. You see, when we read, we read generally this way. Sometimes the young people, and sometimes they do it just in order to create a laugh, you know. They say, oh, so that means if I were to ask Allah, grant me forgetfulness in Ramadan, would it be a good dua? Well, the difficulty is then when your teacher tells you one plus one, you have to scratch your head because you were granted forgetfulness in Ramadan. <laughs> so, we become conscious of what goes into our mouth. We don't want to put things into our mouth because sometimes even after Ramadan is over, we tend not to eat in a rush because we think for a moment, am I fasting? And then you quickly tell yourself, no, I am not. So that is taqwa. You, you first are conscious of the food. But why are you conscious of it? Because of an instruction of Allah. That should make you conscious of your salah. You become conscious of salah because you know there are five salah a day. And I always tell people, the month of Ramadan, fasting alone will not bring about your piety if you have not fulfilled the other duties unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the month. A man who fasts or a woman who fasts, but there's no salah. So you find in some countries where the weather is very hot, they have their suhoor, mashallah, they read salat al fajr, they sleep, and next stop is mother. What was the point? What was the point? The day is turned upside down, becomes night, and the night becomes day. So at night everything happens, they have a double taraweeh. One is the taraweeh that is read for Ramadan, and the other is all the qada one after the other. There's no point in that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need the fact that you abstain from your food and drink. He has given it to you as a gift. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went up in Mi'raj, he was given a gift of salah. How many of us engage in salah considering it a gift of your creator? I promise you, if I were to give you a gift from my pocket of a pen, for example, or you were to give me something, I would probably treasure it depending on who you are to me. If you are an important person who has affected me in my life in a positive way and I look up to you, even if I were to get, for example, a used pen which is worth nothing from you, I would keep it and I would treasure it. And if I were to give it to someone, I would tell them, hey, this is a very valuable pen. I remember once, and I'm going to say it because I want to raise the example, I don't normally like to attend fundraising dinners. I don't normally like, unless it is a very, very worthy cause, and unless it is something that is uh, really called for the people are you know, using their wealth in the right direction and so on. But I feel primarily that, you know, when it comes to an Islamic lecture, Islamic talk, something to do with religion, 
we should try our best to benefit as many people as possible. So usually what happens is even if there is a private talk, sometimes we would tell people, if you have an opportunity, can we please load it up without copyrights on the net? And when we say Islamic material, I'm talking of my own, I'm talking of my own uh, little effort of trying to spread the deen, I have kept it completely copyrightless, which means if someone says this is copyrighted, it's the ink that's copyrighted, not the contents. Because you cannot copyright qala Allahu wa qala Rasul. You cannot copyright them. It's not for you. You don't own it. If Allah had to copyright it, we probably wouldn't even be Muslims. So sometimes, you know, we attend these dinners because we feel the cause is correct. But otherwise, no. And even if we do, we like to see the result of it being spread across far and wide. So, and for your information, we're trying to revamp the website muftimeng.com, inshallah. Shortly, before the month of Ramadan, it will be given a new look with a link straight to YouTube and a link to Twitter and a link to Facebook. Inshallah, there is a brother in Cape Town who is doing that. I have never been directly involved, but mashallah, the one brother who started it has handed it over to another brother who is going to perfect it, inshallah, or at least enhance so that we can maximize the benefit. So this is also a piece of private information for you to make dua. That it tell like it's a success before the month of Ramadan. You have just a one-stop shop, as they say. You know, big wholesale. Instead of going to this retailer and that retailer, checking. Sometimes I don't know myself that this has been uploaded. The talk in Singapore was uploaded yesterday. Someone sent me a message to say this is the link. I don't have time. I did not have time to put it up on Facebook or Twitter or elsewhere to say this is the link. I sent it to some other admin, but they haven't yet put it up. And there was a talk in Mauritius a few days ago as well. And also someone told me it has been uploaded. Allahu A'lam. So instead of going looking here and there and there, inshallah we'll try and centralize as much as we can for the benefit. Going back to the fundraising talk. So one day I was invited to a certain city in South Africa and uh, they were raising funds, they had to raise X amount and they were short by a little bit and they started auctioning things. And I got up and I said, look, if someone were to auction a painting here, it might not be worth more than X amount, but you're paying for, you're actually giving a donation, making a donation. It's not necessarily paying for that. This is just a means. People understand and some people don't. And some people prefer to donate quietly in the back, in the background, you know, without people knowing. So they thought to themselves, we need an amount of money, what do we do? So I said, okay, you can auction my pen. And I had a pen that I took out. You won't believe it. You won't believe it. It started off at about 50 rands in South Africa. And it ended at 5,000 rands. And the pen was only worth about 10 or 20 rands. And Someone purchased it, I don't know who it was. And I had to make an announcement to say, look, in, in South Africa we have a, a term where we say footstuts. Footstuts means as is. This thing is sold as is. If it stops working this evening, I'm sorry. If there's no ink in there, I'm sorry. You don't come back to me and say, but the pen is not working, you know. So why was such a high price paid? To me, it was just a donation. But to someone, it came from a person they looked up to. That's what I think. So they say, no, oh, we'll pay for it, come. Now, subhanAllah, later on my mind has changed. Over time we mature. I promise you, we learn new things every day. I hope you do too. Every day I learn new things. And I learn that, no, there's a better way of doing things. Now, I'd rather keep the pen in my pocket and donate 5,000 from myself. That's how I would be today. I've changed in thinking over time. Because, what statement is that? It's not really a good statement if you look at it carefully. So we mature as time passes. The point I'm making is that of fasting, that of salah. Do you consider salah a gift from Allah? What are you prepared to sacrifice to value that gift of Allah? That's the question. In the month of Ramadan, sometimes we don't fast. I am ready because I want to value something from you, to pay 5,000 to value it from you. Because there is a link between me and you. 
but I'm not ready to pay 10 minutes five times a day to value something from the one who made me, who's far more important than anyone and everyone else that can exist. Amazing. You see how we've taken a look at it from a different angle. Totally different angle. And this is why the hadith speaks about how important it is to watch what comes out of your mouth. Everyone is concerned about what goes in. So we won't eat, mashallah. If we make a mistake, we've already spoken about the narration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if you take a careful look at how we operate as Muslimin, we think, okay, stay away from food, drink, permissible sexual desires and so on, and from dawn to dusk in, in its quickest translation, and that's it. In the afternoons, when tempers begin to flare, because the English saying is a hungry man is an angry man. They forgot to speak about a hungry woman. <laughs> they forgot to speak about a hungry woman. One wonders what might happen there. She would tear down the whole home. But I think they kept quiet intentionally, because that you have to experience personally. <laughs> it differs. So, a hungry man is an angry man. People, what happens to them is, Two o'clock, I don't know, I'm talking of my experience, three o'clock, and they begin to become upset and angry with small things. You know, a vehicle cut in front of you and <laughs> swear words, big swear words, and big acts and actions and so on, and fingers this way and that way. Oh, oh my God. But you are fasting, my brother. You are fasting, my sister. Take it easy. But he mustn't do that. Oh, who do you think? Shut up. Who do you think you are? Oh, <laughs> what language you want to use in Ramadan? Not only that, it should be after Ramadan. Not only after Ramadan, but at any time of the day or night, you should be careful as a Muslim. Allah is giving you one month of training to show you how to lead the other 11 months. That's what it is. One month of training. So that is why the hadith covers those people as well. What does the hadith say? مَن لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ وَالْجَهْلَ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ Whoever does not abandon, whoever does not leave foul utterances, that which is false, you know, gossip, slander, false witness, and whoever does not leave acting ignorantly during the month of Ramadan, behaving in an un-Islamic manner during the month of Ramadan or whilst they are fasting, Allah says, they need to know that Allah does not require them abstaining from their food and drink. It hasn't helped them in any way. Allah doesn't need the fact that you stayed away from food and drink. In fact, it is a gift to you. Many of us have or would need to modify our understanding of the acts of worship in Islam. They are to benefit you, not to benefit Allah. Many people sometimes when you sit and talk to them, they might not say it. We might be guilty as well, we might not say it, but we feel, oh, I've done Allah a favor, meaning I've read my salah, now, you know, it's okay, because now Allah won't be angry and upset. It's true, you won't be angry and upset, but look at it the other way around. Now you, your life will be led in a much more content manner that would be better for you to begin with, for those around you, and Allah had given it to you as a gift, all you're doing is you're just fulfilling. Imagine Allah has forced us to do certain things. He's kept them compulsory like Salah. I want to give you an example of a child in your home. You have a child. The child is growing up in your home. And what happens? You say, my son, I don't want you to go there. And the son says, no, I'm going. You say, no, you will not. And you close the door and you lock it. You close the door and you lock it. And you force your child to stay home because you know that, look, if you go out there, there is going to be a disaster. What have you done? Have you done anything wrong? No, you know that if the child goes out, there is a problem. Mashallah, I can't remember when last I drank water while speaking. Alhamdulillah. So you would know that I have blocked the child forcefully because I know what's out there. And then 
your child is lazy and you take them to school and say, no ways, you're coming whether you like it or not. And you know that in the long run, this is beneficial for the child. Or the child, for example, doesn't want to go to the doctor and you force them there and say, you have to come because you want that child to benefit. It's for the benefit of the child. That example is easy for me and you to understand. But when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us a gift. He forces us to engage in certain items. When I say force, I mean He's kept it compulsory. Because it's our benefit. It's more important than going to the doctor when sick. He's reading Salah when the time of Salah has entered. More important than breathing is fulfilling Salah when the time has entered. Believe me, right? we tend to look at it differently sometimes. We don't realize it's actually for my benefit that I need to give zakah. Why? My love of wealth must not be such that it comes as a barrier between me and Allah, number one. Number two, it must not be such that my life is spent running behind figures that are not going to be mine anyway. Because what happens, how much are you going to spend in your life? Most of us, when we die, there is an excess. And some of us, when we die, there is a huge excess. What was the point of that? Well, if it was in the right direction, in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we thank Allah that He made us from those who have had, and on top of that, we did not disobey Allah. And on top of that, we were conscious of the fact that Allah has only provided a means for us to lead a life that will be more comfortable, rather than a life that is full of difficulty and hardship. So we should be thanking Allah instead of letting our heads swell, thinking now that I have money, I can boss this one around, that one around, I can talk how I want to whomsoever I want. What is that? If that's the case, we've lost the whole plot, as I always say. So zakah is a gift for us so that we can develop our character, our conduct, we can become conscious of Allah. Salah is a gift for us so that we get up on time, we can sleep on time. May Allah grant me the ability also to sleep on time, mashallah. And we can get up on time, sleep on time, we can plan our days properly, rotating around that salah. Because when you have a concern for salah, your whole day is definitely made or planned out much better than if you don't have concern for salah, there's no salah to be read. People say as it is, so you get up very late, you don't know when to sleep, you don't have the time, you know, the lunch time is always at a different time and so on. We need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. The same would apply if we were to go for hajj. Some people say, well, you know, I'm going to fulfill the hajj because I need to get it done and over with or over and done with. If that's the attitude, I think we're wrong. It's not something of that. It's such a great act of worship. You need to fulfill your duty unto Allah for your benefit. That's what it is. Not for Allah's benefit, your benefit. So I will go for Hajj. Before I go, I will learn about it. Before I go, I will make sure that I am ready in the sense that I am going to surrender to Allah's instruction. You see, in Hajj, we pelt the devil. Many people have looked at it in many different ways. If you've ever heard a talk of mine on Hajj, I usually draw the attention to something else, to say when you go into Mina, you collect pebbles. What are you doing? There's no devil there. Believe me, there's no shaitan in Mina. He's not there. It's just a symbolic stone at the moment where shaitan was. So we are going to pelt where shaitan was. It's not like he's there. If that was shaitan, and he was feeling the pain, we would have to had to throw rocks, believe me. But no, the pebble is the size of half of this top little compartment of the finger. I wonder what you call it in the English language, but the little top section here, half of it, the size of a pea, I'd like to think, and you're just throwing it within the basin. It doesn't even have to hit that pillar, it's within the basin. Why? One of the reasons is, first day you pelt the, the, what is known as the big devil with seven little pebbles. As each one is leaving your hand, one major bad habit and quality or sin that you are involved in that you are not leaving needs to depart with it and be left in Mina before you go home. 
So the first day, how many bad habits? The shirk came out, number one. I'm never going to associate partners with Allah again after today. It's out. The second one, what, what happened? The habit of lying, telling lies, gone. So two habits are gone. This is why you're sitting in Mina, meditating the first few days. People just sit and go, walk around. I heard that woman is here for Hajj, let's go and see her. I heard that man is there for Hajj, let's go and see him. I heard that this. I heard the Russians bring about some very nice items from Russia and they are selling them in one corner of Mina. Take me there, let's go and buy it. Take out our money. That's not what it's all about. You may well meet someone or something, but that's not the main aim. Or well, that is not even one of the aims that we are supposed to be looking at. When we go for Hajj, you're sitting in Mina and you're sitting in Arafah and you're contemplating over your weaknesses. You can take a pen and jot down what you'd like to leave in Mina. When you've felt your lies is gone, your pride is gone, meaning pride, the wrong type of pride here. You know, the jealousy, the envy, the, the, the gossiping, the slander, the, the, the laziness. Whoa, that's a big one that would disappear. Your laziness is gone. From this day, no more laziness in the obedience of Allah. That's what makes you a haji. This is why they say, to, be, to go for hajj is easy, but to come back and live as a haji is not easy. To go for hajj, one of the signs of an accepted hajj is that your life has changed after that. What does that mean? All my bad habits are there. Where? That big basin. They all left there. So first day, seven. Those are the highlights. After that, you've still got the second day, another 21. The third day, another 21. That's the minimum. 21, 21, and 7. 49 bad habits, sins, and you know, things that you needed to get rid of left there. You would come out as pure as the day you were born. This is the hadith. This is what Rasulullah is speaking about. And obviously, people look at it differently. Some people just say it's just a ritual we're fulfilling. You know, just say, you're just pelting the devil, Allah Akbar, and you're throwing your stone. That's not all that it's about. It's about much deeper than that. You are supposed to achieve the piety even through Hajj. It's for your benefit. Hajj is not in order to help Allah achieve something. Never. Astaghfirullah. Nor is it in order to show off to Ibrahim alayhi salam that you know what, be part of those who follow, you know, what you came with, the message you came with. It's not in order to do that. It is for the sake of Allah, for the pleasure of Allah, but for our benefit, we need to improve. Our lives will improve and Allah says, if you improve your life in accordance with what I have taught you, then your life after death will automatically improve. Automatically improve. So Allah wants me and you to lead a happy life, to lead a life of goodness, of purity, of discipline, to lead a life where I'm bothered about myself and my weaknesses. Today you look at someone and you start thinking, this guy here is a sinful guy, this guy is probably astray, or this person is like, for what? Worry about yourself if you have the opportunity to relay a good message, relay it. If not, concerning with the lives of other people or, should I say, being bothered about the lives of others in a way that we are forgetting. Whatever we are meant to be doing in our own lives is definitely a plot of shaitan. It's a plot of shaitan. So this is how we would achieve piety. The reason why I've spoken about hajj and zakah together with that of fasting and salah is because we are supposed to achieve piety by all these pillars of Islam. But right now, the next opportunity we are going to get, what is it? The month of Ramadan. Salah is on a daily basis that we should be fulfilling. And as I said, it, there is a lot to be learned from Salah. In the month of Ramadan, Wallahi, we will be abstaining from food and drink. And we will be engaged in so many extra acts of worship. Allah has <coughs> multiplied the reward, multiplied the reward of the good deeds you engage in in Ramadan. It's like a sale. I was in Singapore yesterday. And one of the brothers says, he was asking about Salah and Qasr. And I made a statement which I repeated when I entered KL as well. I said, if Allah has given me a 50% discount, I don't want to give it back. I want to make use of it. If you enter the huge supermarket and they tell you, welcome, welcome, today in the supermarket for you, 50% discount. Would you say, nah, pay the 50%, it's okay. You know? We wouldn't do that. It's coming up to 5,000 ringgit. You, you only need to pay 2.5. Why would you 
take out the other 2.5 and pay it for nothing. You wouldn't do that. So this is why the hadith says in Allah, يُحِبُّ أَنْ يُبْتَعُ خَصَرُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it when you make use of his discounts that he has given you. He gave you a discount as a musafir. Read, you read your two raka'ah, the others will read their four. It's fine, carry on. He, he, you're making use of something. It's permissible sometimes, according to some of the madahib, to complete a salah. And Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi does not allow it at all. He says, no ways. You should, you must read that salah as it is. Qasr is pro prohibited for you to complete it when Allah told you that you should read two. So that's one of the madahib. But if we look at it carefully, it's a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have gifts on a daily basis. You know, we need so many things in life to go right. What beats me is when our health is failing and we have a cholesterol problem and we have a weight problem and we have this problem and that problem. We want to engage in this diet and that diet and force ourselves to abstain from food, becoming anorexic sometimes and, you know, becoming sick. And sometimes we would abstain from doing certain things when the doctor tells us, but when Allah says it, then why do we find ourselves not taking it as seriously? Here, one month every year for Muslimin, you cut down on your food. And I want to quickly tell you what is very, very harmful, very harmful for myself and yourselves, to have fried food as soon as you open your fast. Many people have fried food, things that are very unhealthy, sweet meats, fried food, so on. The hadith tells you that that breaking of the fast was either on dates or on water. They are known as al-aswadan, the two black things. Dates and water, that is the meaning of it. So if you have a date, alhamdulillah, if not, you have water. If you have both, mashallah, we say nurun ala So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the gift. But today, mashallah, we have a ceremonial date. You know what's a ceremonial date? Just put it in the mouth, next thing the samosas are in, the pies are in, the little small, you know, I don't know what they call, but those little sweet things are in, something else is in, as much as we can stuff ourselves with before the hitam of the salah, that eight minutes we like sort of pregnant, Allah protect us. <coughs> Allah, Akbar, Allah make it easy for all those who are expecting it. So here we have a gift of Allah, whereas we take it as though I just missed out on food, let me just send it. That's not the case. And then after that, we need to know that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept taraweeh, would we be able to fill taraweeh with a full stomach? Today, if you had to eat before Salatul Isha, and then you had to come to read Salatul Isha, let's be honest, how long would you be able to be in ruku or sujood for? What would bring you up is your belly, nothing else. You're just settling down, subhana rabbi al ala, and next thing you up. But why are you so, oh, you know, it was when my belly was being pressed. Because you ate too much. So if there is so much of, you know, salah in terms of taraweeh, that's extra salah. That means you should relax, take it easy on your food. You know, you don't want to go to Rukur and next thing you feel, you know, uh, everything going out of order here. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us that salah. Another point I'd like to quickly raise, because it's the, speaking about the month of Ramadan. We have another issue, and that is the issue of the speed. Let's leave speed for when we drive motor vehicles, and then too, I'm coming from Singapore, you know, there's a very big difference between Malaysia and Singapore when it comes to, I think, generally breathing outside as well. Allah Akbar. So if you go to Singapore, it's like you read the riot act, you know, to tell you, you breathe, you're going to be jailed. You exhale, you're going to be jailed. Uh, you eat, you're going to be jailed. You chew gum, you're going to be jailed. You throw anything out there, you're going to be jailed. You walk, you're going to be jailed. You talk, you're going to be jailed. Okay. Today I joked with one of the brothers and I said, they should just put a big fence around the whole of Singapore. I said, guys, don't worry, you're in jail. <laughs> Because it's a feeling you get, you're just looking everywhere. I wonder who's supposed to tell on me if I'm chewing gum, for example. Who is it? This guy, that guy. This one. <laughs> Subhanallah. So what happens is speeding, we're worried about speeding when it comes to motor vehicles. We slow down because we know there's a trap here. 
In South Africa, mashallah, they have a very advanced system as well. You clicked and in two days time you have, mashallah, everything arriving at your home with amount and you have a little negative of the image of what's happening. You cannot deny anything and it's done. So, we are so conscious about how we drive because we fear paying a thousand, two thousand ringgates. So we will not speed because we're worried about the policeman. But Tarawih, we speed at 500 kilometers an hour. <laughs> Believe me, I've seen people who just come down, come back up, come. We should have speeding traps, I promise you. Say, if you go down into the court before a million crosses, you, you're going to have to pay. And if you come back up before you've actually settled down in Rukur, you're going to pay. And if you get to, if you complete your Taraweeh before so many minutes are up, you're going to pay. That's not the case in reality. But in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you complete your Salah in a flash like this, you will not achieve what you're meant to be achieving by it. And you will not have helped yourself. And you may have earned the sin by disrespecting your maker, by making it seem that you're doing him a favor. Wallahi. Those who rush in salah, what do they think they want? Do you think Allah wants that salah? For what? Take your time, relax. Allahu Akbar. Do you know what you've said? Allah has heard the one who has praised him. We say, Oh, oh our Rabb, we are praising you. So Allah hears the ones who praise him and immediately we say, oh Allah, we are praising you. Sometimes we don't even know what it means. We just say, Sami Allah. Allah. I, I'm honest with you, a lot of us are guilty and sometimes even those who try to be conscious once in a while when you're in a rush. Why do you think the Prophet says that, you know there is a hadith, and obviously this hadith, there are a few narrations of it. One of them is a sweet narration which they say is not extremely authentic. But the other one is a little bit more authentic than that. One says, إِذَا حَضَرَ الْعَشَاءُ وَالْعِشَاءَ فَقَدِّمُ الْعَشَاءَ I'm sure you might have heard that. If, if Isha Salah is ready and Asha, which means dinner is also ready, then you have your dinner first and then you read your Salah. Now that is not a correct narration of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is a more correct narration where he speaks about uh, Salah, Salat al-Maghrib and food and coming together and similar meaning where you would have, you would eat together, you would eat quickly and then read your Salah. The meaning of it is correct because what we need to understand if there is a beautiful dish out there prepared for us with an aroma and we are hungry, you will be insulting your maker when you're eating. You give food preference over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're saying Allahu Akbar and you're saying I need to. If the Imam is delaying, you're going to think to yourself, hey, my, my pie is getting cold there. <laughs> and you know, you're just so, it's an anti-climax. You're actually in there and you really don't want to be there. It's like when you serve tea sometimes, I don't know, but sometimes the, when the tea gets very cold, it doesn't taste nice. Well, that's according to me. Some people have cold tea. And nowadays you have iced tea for your information. So that's another topic going on. But if the tea, imagine if it's poured already, and then someone says, hang on, let's read Salah. And you're a person who loves hot tea. A cup of tea will be given preference over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you're going to be reading Salah in such that you're going to say subhanallah bi ala less because you've got tea waiting for you. So rather, hang on a second, have your tea. Perhaps you might burn yourself a bit. But you can then make dua, Allah grant me, you know, ease in my mouth. I've already got a blister here because of my rush for the tea. That's better than having compromised your Salah. Better to have had that blister. And we're not saying take your time. Some people say, no, you know, Salah, we'll, we'll read it later, so let's have a meal. And now you're enjoying a luscious meal. One, two hours later, you say, right, let's get up for Salah. No, you have a little bit, which means, you know, whatever your, your desires were very clung to at that particular time. And then, mashallah, you engage in your Salah, you fulfill your Salah. So why I say this is the point of speed, especially when it comes to Taraweeh. I know one uncle, his memory wasn't strong, so when he used to lead the Salah, he used to lead as Imam. He didn't used to know how many rakaat, how many rakaat am I reading? So he used to keep 10 coins in his pocket. After every two rakaat, he put one coin on the side. And there they read 20 rakaat, 20 rakaat. So what happens? After that he puts another coin. And then he knows that he, people would look at the coins, how many coins are there? They always <laughs> 
eight coins, that means it's just four like a half Wow, you know, it's like laying down here. And do you notice, uh, I don't know if you notice, I notice it. When you're reading Taraweeh and the Quran is being recited, sometimes the last rakat seem longer than the first. Because the first ones you're still energetic and you're standing, before you know it, you're already down in Rukua. And sometimes what happens, as you get to the last later rakat of the evening, it seems like it's stretching and it's going longer because now you're getting tired and you know you're getting... So what I do, we play a psychological game with the Musallis. The first few must be long. And after that down here, nobody feels it. Because after that, you cut it short. And I even tell some of the Imams to do the same thing. Try it out. Let your first few rakat be quite long. Because people are still energetic, psychologically. Another point is, when you read melodiously, without raising your voice, without getting tired yourself, the people behind you do not get as tired. You need to know that. And then when you have a sound system like this one, I think this is fit to be in a huge masjid. Beautiful sound system, you feel like sitting, listening, you know. Right now I'm talking, I feel like talking to you. Because I, I'm not straining myself, and at the same time, I'm sure you can hear every word, because it's very clear, MashaAllah, JazakAllah khair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant acceptance to all of us. So here we have a month of Ramadan, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to grant us maximum benefit of this month. I will not end before. I speak on one entire issue which is extremely important and that is the month of Ramadan is known as the month of the Quran. The month of the Quran. The reason is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we have revealed this Quran in the month of Ramadan. Now we know it was revealed over a period of 23 years. But it was sent down from the preserved tablet to the lowest heaven in the month of Ramadan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it down fully, wholly, also in the month of Ramadan in that way. And in the month of Ramadan, Jibreel alayhi salam used to come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he used to revise the Quran with him. Yudarisuhul Quran. Literally, revising the Quran with him, teaching, listening, reading. And this is how the Qur'an is today, how it is. It was the month of Ramadan when Jibreel alayhi salam used to come. So much so, that in the last year, he, they revised it twice. In the last year, they revised it twice, the Qur'an. Every one of us should make it his or her own business to cover the Qur'an from the beginning to the end with the understanding of its meaning at least once, once in the month of Ramadan. And I'm telling you, if you have not done this, you have not yet started implementing what is meant to be achieved in the month of Ramadan. So nobody should tell me I don't have time. No, you do. You make the time. If I were to tell you uh, something you really love to make time for, you would create it. You'd make sure you were there. So I want to repeat this. Every one of us, during the 30 days of Ramadan, we must cover the Quran from cover to cover. I'm not only speaking of the Arabic recitation, but together with the understanding of its meaning. It's a challenge, isn't it? Because the first part of it might be easy. I know even the older people tell you today, I covered 10 Jews. Well, my sister, cover one, but read its meaning. Wallahi, we are guilty. And I've always said it, and you who are here this evening, you know that I've always said, that we are guilty of reading other books, but we haven't yet covered the Quran. I'm sure you've all heard me say that. And it's a fact, and I will continue repeating it as a benefit for myself. Because what has changed me, if you want to know, is the message of the Quran. And that's what can change all of us. If the Quran cannot change you, nothing can change you. Nothing can. Because it's the most powerful. Like they tell you, you know, I've got this medical problem, go to this doctor, go to that doctor, then some, all the doctors tell you, you know what, there's a top hospital with the best doctor in the world. And if he tells you no hope, I think, well, we as Muslims still have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but ultimately a person will say, well, now the road is over. So the point I'm raising is if we do not become affected by the Quran and we don't take its message seriously, what message are we going to take seriously? What do you want to take seriously? You're waiting for a person like me to come about to talk to you? No. What I say is not even going to say hello to you if the Quran hasn't already motivated you. 
And if I say something from the Quran, it's the Quran that moves, not me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. So that is the duty. And Allah has provided such a great discount in the month of Ramadan. Or should I say, such multiplication of rewards in the month of Ramadan. He is basically by all means trying to lure you into going into it by hook or crook, so to speak. What this means is, he tells you, you read the letter, you get 10 rewards. That's outside Ramadan. Come Ramadan, we'll multiply it for you. How much fold? Okay, either sevenfold, tenfold, seventyfold, seven hundredfold, and even beyond, depending on your intention and your condition. Amazing. Allah, I think we are foolish not to take note of that. Even if you just know five verses of the Quran, keep repeating it from morning to evening, you will achieve so much in the month of Ramadan. So that, I, in a nutshell, I've spoken about how important it is to revise the meanings of the Quran during the month of Ramadan. Together with its recitation, we are not belittling the recitation. Remember, the recitation is very, very important. Even if you don't know what it means to recite it, we do not compromise that. We know that it's very important. You should know how to read and you should read on a daily basis. But we are speaking about an obligation over and above recitation, which is equally important. And that is to understand the meanings. It will act as an interceder on the day of Qiyamah for you. Al-Qur'an hujjatul laka aw alayka. The Qur'an is going to come for every one of us and act either for us, bear witness for us on the day of judgment or against us, depending on how we dealt with it. So you ask yourself, what about me? Will this Qur'an come in and bear witness for me? Or will it bear witness against me? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those whom the Quran bear with, bears witness for and not against. And Allah says, Inna Allah la yarfa'u bihada al-kitabi aqwaman wa yada'u bihi akhareen. Through this Quran, Allah raises certain people and through the same Quran, Allah drops other people. Ask yourselves, which way are we? Heading this way or that way? How is your link with your book? How is your link with the book that your maker sent to you? If your link is strong, inshallah, please, my brothers and sisters, make an intention here and now. Every day, one, two verses at least. Read the Arabic of it, read the English of it, digest it, understand it, ask about it. And before you know it, you have completed the whole book. Do you know time flies? Nobody would have believed, including myself, that I would be here so soon. I wouldn't have believed it. But Allah made a means. And it was very impromptu, planned in a very, you know, different way. But here it is. Time flies. Before we know it, the year will be over. We, we either will meet again or either of us will be gone into the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can happen and it will. Be, as you grow older, time begins to move faster. And things begin to look smaller. When I was young, the lounge where I live in my own home used to look huge. And I used to have to like walk almost a mile to get from one side to the other. Now it's five or ten steps and I'm already on the other side. It's because you're small, everything looks big. Now we're big, everything looks small. When you're small, one week is like a, like a long, long time. Now that you grow old, a week is like a, an hour. Last week, where was I? If I tell you what happened in the last two weeks in my life, you probably get a shock. No wonder you're so sick. May Allah grant us good health. So, are we going to say, okay, I'll do it, inshallah, I'll wait for Ramadan. If you are going to wait for Ramadan to read the Quran, you might not see the month of Ramadan this year. You might die before that. And so many have died and people are going to die. It might be me or you. So why wait? Make an intention, my beloved brothers and sisters, here and now, that tonight before I sleep, I'm going to read one verse and I'm going to see its meaning. If I understand it, alhamdulillah. If I don't, I'll ask about it. Please. Is that very difficult? One verse, one. You know, we get so excited, oh, there's a talk, let's go and see, let's go and listen. MashaAllah, yes, I am going to be asked, and you are going to be asked, you are here, what did you take back? Take back one verse a day, is that too much? It's like asking you for one ringgit a day, is that too much? It's nothing, believe me, it's small. The benefit of it will be more than the billions that you could ever have achieved here in the dunya. And many times we start looking at the Quran and say, I'm only at the beginning. You know, 10 years ago in September 2000, in Harare, where I come from, 
the sisters were asking for programs and they were saying, please, we need something, there's nothing for the women folk and so on. A lot of the masajid don't even cater for women and so on. So we decided every Sunday between 11 and 12 o'clock, we will start teaching them something. And we started slowly but surely. Today, we have covered, I think perhaps what, 12 years down the line? And we have covered 19 juz of the Quran in quite detailed tafsir. Every week we go through a few verses. 45 minutes, not more than 50 minutes. I don't think ever more than 50 minutes. Quarter past 11 to 12 o'clock. We start at 11. It's a sister's program, so some of the sisters will get up and say a few motivational words, perhaps a hadith or two and so on, and then the, the, one of the ulama will come up. Whenever I am there, I normally I make sure that I am available. And uh, whenever I am there, we move in order. We started off by speaking about belief and tahara and salah and fasting and hajj and so on. Then we went on to various rules of Islam, then we went on to the life of Muhammad sallallahu and then we went on to the lives of all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we started the tafsir of the Quran. Now if, if we were to think today that when am I ever going to get to the 19th juice, I'm reading a verse a day. Believe me, if you read a verse a day, a verse a day, I think within 15 to 20 years we'll have covered the whole Quran. Depending. And if you read a verse a day, there will come a time when automatically you're going to read more than just a verse. It will, it will be so beautiful for you, you're going to increase. So bear this in mind. And let's not wait for the month of Ramadan before we start this goodness. Prepare it now. Just like, we've got to go back to food and drink, mashallah. Just like the sisters have already started preparing for Ramadan, am I right? Well, some are saying no and some are saying yes, mashallah. Uh, well, those who are saying no, perhaps they've got husbands who probably will just take them to purchase, so they're lucky. But in, in, in our countries, they start preparing because they do it on their own. Everything is done from scratch, on their own. And sometimes, you know, uh, with the halal meat and so on, you, we've got to actually have our own chickens and, and, and you know, slaughter ourselves and so on, at times, in certain homes. So, mashallah, preparation starts. But, in the same way, Okay, let's, let's not say it, is, it has already started, but in the same way, before Ramadan commences, we know what we're going to cook, and we know what we're going to fry for the evening, and we know what's going to happen. The fridges are there, full. Let us also be prepared for the Quran in that month, and for the fasting in that month. And do you know what else? For the zakah that we may choose to give in the month of Ramadan. Zakah, you don't have to wait for Ramadan. Once the year is over, the Nisab is there, and the conditions are met, you've got to give it. But some people choose to give it in the month of Ramadan to multiply a reward. To multiply a reward. Well, if that's the case, Alhamdulillah. But remember, from now, start calculating, start seeing what you have, start preparing, and so on. And put yourself into the mode of giving. Why we say put yourself into the mode of giving? The Quran, or should I say the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has taught us that the month of Ramadan is also the month of generosity and the month of giving. Because the hadith speaks about Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajwad al-nas. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most generous of all people. Most generous. He would give away anything and everything. Just give it away. Most generous. There are so many narrations, I'm not going to go into them right now, where he has given away things that people wouldn't even have thought, subhanAllah, to give away because they have need of it. You are in need of something and you're giving it away. And his companions had similar qualities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises them in the Quran. Allah says, يُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا They gave preference over themselves even though they needed what they've just given away. Allahu Akbar. Imagine, with us, we, sometimes we can't even give something that we don't really need, it's extra, it's excess. In our cupboards we have clothes we haven't worn for more than a year. If that's the case, give it away. We have shoes that we haven't worn for more than two years. I know some of the sisters, mashallah, they keep their dresses of the first year of marriage. And every other weekend when they're cleaning up, they look at it and say, I'll fit in it one day, inshallah. 
He wanted my sister. Gone are those days. Give it away. If you are meant to fit in it, you will get something better sold for you, inshallah. Allahu Akbar. Don't worry. We know that you have engaged in such a great jihad of giving birth and of having, you know, sometimes cooked so much that you happen to taste the food so much that you happen to gain weight, mashallah, before the food was even served. Allahu Akbar. I think that's what I'd like to know. Let's talk about the one of childbirth. Such that, don't worry if your body doesn't get back to where it was. It's not all about bodies. We, as Muslim men, should understand this. It's not about shape and size. There was once a brother who came to me and said, I no longer love my wife. I said, but why? You know, when I married her, she, she had a figure like a trigger. <laughs> and now, she looks like a big bear. <laughs> So I, I told him, how many children do you have? He says, eight. <laughs> eight children. You have eight children. So who caused that figure <laughs> to convert to a teddy bear, Marshall? Wasn't it you? Your action, your doing, and now you want to blame her? Go back and, you know, appreciate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And he tells me, no, but she is a good mother. I said, well, there you are. These are the things a mu'min must look at. You know, you don't just look at the outward. What's the point of having a pie that looks so sweet, but in, inside it doesn't even taste good? Sometimes you have some, you know, these uh, food stuff that sometimes is not so attractive, but if you eat into it, subhanAllah, you really say, that's my favorite dish. And here when it comes to those whom we marry, how can we just say, oh, you know, subhanAllah, she's now changed over years size-wise. So, is that when you married her for size? If that was the case, tell her from day one, look, no kids, I'm just interested in size. You know, so as long as you're looking like a figure of this nature, this is what it is. The point I'm making is going back to the old rule. Don't worry about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you with your figure once again. And Allah will bless you with something more than that, perhaps without that. But if we are going to cling on to our old items, sometimes, thinking things, Wallahi, you could have achieved paradise by giving away something that you're just holding in your cupboard to someone who perhaps needed it somewhere across the globe. Think of it. You could have. And we take it for granted. I once entered a home, and you know, the brother knows that he, he's allowed me to talk about it, so it's fine. I once entered a home and I told the brother, look, you know, I'll come, but please don't try and don't advertise it. We don't want too many people around because I need a bit of a break. So he says, okay, don't worry, I guarantee there'll be no one. And as I entered the home, you know, there's a rack to put shoes. And I saw so many shoes and I said, oh, brother, what's happened here, man? Are we having a ladies program? Because, you know, sometimes you notice all shoes and you... He says, no, man. Nobody's home. I said, the holy shit, no, these are my wife's shoes. <laughs> At least 45 days. <laughs> so I said, can't you keep them in the cupboard? He says, no, there's no place there. He says, and you know what? She just wants to display them. I said, I was shocked. So he, he emailed me a few weeks ago. I can't remember whose name he said, but he said, a certain celebrity on the globe, some of you might know, has now opened up a museum or oh, I think it was a world leader, one of the ex filipini leaders or something, opened up a museum only to show the shoes. And I, I couldn't believe it. And he sent a link of BBC to show me on the news. And I said, wow, I read it and I said, uh oh, is this where we're getting it from? I must display the shoes I had. Wallahi, if we would like to receive the reward after we have died, those shoes, instead of putting them into glass closets out there, give them to those who are being really who are treading the hot sand of you know the heat of africa or south america or wherever else that it is needed i don't even know sometimes and that would result in the coolness in your grave rather than keeping it in a glass closet boasting to the world that i had every tint of pink and green and orange and purple and every size of shoe so that i could knock the head of my husband in any way i wish why should we have that to show the rest of the world no oh. And I've actually seen a shoe that comes at the back so sharp that it's a pin that would probably damage the floor when people walked. And you know, they, they've even got a name for it. Allahu Akbar. What a shoe. Anyway, 
That's besides the point. The type of shoe you want to wear, it's between you and your maker and between, you know, uh, it's yourself. But we're talking about extravagance. The month of giving, the month of generosity. Why should we not look into our closets and give away things? Look into our, you know, the items we have, something you haven't used, give it away. We are, we are not yet talking about something you might need to give away. We're talking about that which you don't need, for sure. And on top of that, we give the month, in the month of Ramadan, we give our charities. The Prophet was a very generous, very generous man. <clears throat> in fact, the hadith says, the most generous of people. And he was even more generous in the month of Ramadan when Jibreel السلام, used to come to him and they used to study the Quran. Allahu Akbar. So surely the Quran has in it some softening point and it increases our generosity. If your heart cannot be soothed by the dhikr of Allah and by the Quran, nothing will soothe your heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. And as you see, mashallah, the barakah of speaking uh, about deen normally makes you forget how ill you're feeling. And alhamdulillah, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me this opportunity to address the brothers and sisters. And inshallah, I think we will break just now. Uh, I, I thought of opening the floor for questions, but I'm thinking, I think of revising that uh, thought and making it, inshallah, just closing the session as where we are. And perhaps shortly we will read Salat al Isha, after which, inshallah, you'll excuse me. And the brothers, inshallah, I will greet you as uh, I'm walking. And uh, it, if, just for the benefit of myself and yourselves, if we can just stick to a handshake, inshallah, it will do us much good. And the sisters, Jazakumullah khair for coming. Uh, as I said, this was not advertised at all. It was not expected at all. But when there is an opportunity to serve the cause, and there are people showing a keen interest, I think it would be wrong. If I died in a few minutes' time, I would regret not having spoken to people and reminded them about Dean. Because who knows, even if we are motivated in one way, if each one of us fulfill the little promise we made within our hearts to go home and read a verse of the Quran, and to do that every day in the morning or in the afternoon, I think subhanAllah we have achieved so much. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us every form of goodness. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah alhamdulillah, subhanaka ba'amu alhamdulillah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu.